Today, I return to my discussion of that small star that we see in renditions of Our Lady of Fatima, which is known in tradition as the Star of Esther. It directs us to the historical Book of Esther, which centers on secrets and revelations, a plot among nations against one kingdom and the elect, prayer and sacrifice, and the final triumph of the queen. As I related in the previous broadcast, episode number 14 of Signs and Secrets, entitled The Star of Esther and Our Lady of Fatima, the humble Jewish maiden Esther became the Queen of Persia, but for a reason established by the Lord. Esther, whose Hebrew name was Hadassah, had been raised by her uncle Mordecai. Now he, as I demonstrated in the previous broadcast, is a man who appears to be a type within a type. He seems to embody in his person the faithful in exile, but also Saint Joseph, who was the chaste guardian of the Virgin Mary, as well as a vizier or a vicar, as in the Vicar of Christ, an office which in the future from Esther's time would be established by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now, before Esther was taken with the other maidens to the king so that he may choose a new queen, as again I related in the last episode, the Old Testament makes clear that Esther received certain instructions for Mordecai, who we later learn was a guardian of the king's gate. Therefore, in obedience to her uncle Mordecai, Esther revealed to the king neither her ancestry nor her Hebrew name, nor her kinship to Mordecai. As I discovered in my research, the Hebrew texts relate that she instead gave her name as Hester with an H. But in Persian, the name is Esther, which means star. As we shall see, this change in name was more than a translation. Dear listeners, hello and welcome. I'm Mariana Bartold, the guest host of Signs and Secrets, featured by the Fatima Center. I am the author of Fatima, the Signs and Secrets, and Guadalupe, Secrets of the Image, and the host of my own modest channel called Genesis 315. Thanks, as always, to the generosity of the Fatima Center. You will find in the description box links to my works and my channel. Now, why do I maintain that the name Hester is more than a translation? As a brief recap, Esther's true Hebrew name, Hadassah, is a name that means myrtle, which is a white, five-pointed, star-shaped flower. But wait, there's more. First, the alteration from Hadassah to Hester, again from the Hebrew text, refers to a secret because Hester emphasis on that letter H translates to hidden star or hidden meaning of the star. As we discover, Esther had three secrets, as does her perfect figure type, Our Lady, especially at Fatima. Second, the Hebrew name for the book of Esther is Megalat Hester, meaning revelation hidden or revelation of that which is hidden. By displaying the Star of Esther on her long white tunic, it seems that Our Lady of Fatima not only wishes to, as Frere Michael of the uh, Holy Trinity once wrote in his epic three-volume work, discreetly suggest a hidden and sublime aspect of her unique vocation as mediatrix, but also secrets within secrets or revelations within revelations. Third, the wordplay of Megalot Hester suggests another meaning. God is hiding his face. The Hebrew text of the book of Esther, which ends with chapter 10, verse 3, and though the Dewey Rheim translation of the Holy Bible continues with more, happens to lack any mention of God's name. Jewish scholars refer to the Lord's role as Hester Panem, or hidden face. Clearly, the implications for our own times are staggering. Now, the plot in Esther builds all because her uncle Mordecai did not attend her marriage banquet. Rather, as the Bible tells us, he stayed at the king's gate. 
This one reference is a figure type of some depth. The royal marriage banquet foreshadows the virgin as the bride of the divine spouse and the church as the bride of Christ. It reminds us of St. Joseph, the chaste protector of the Virgin Mary, whom the church calls the Eastern Gate or the King's Gate, and of course the child Jesus, who is the King of Kings. Mordecai, standing at the King's Gate, typifies he who guards the kingdom of God on earth, as well as the faithful in the kingdom. The gates themselves refer to both the Virgin, called the Gate of Heaven, and the church, whom or whom our Lord called the narrow gate. <clears throat> so it was that by lingering at the king's gate, Mordecai overheard a conspiracy to kill the king. He approached and secretly told Esther, who in Mordecai's name relayed the plot to the king, her husband, thus saving the king's life. Now soon afterward, the king advanced Amman, who was of the race of Agag, a race which, as the Old Testament reveals to us, was at perpetual enmity with the Jews. And so the king set him above all the princes. As a result, the king's servants bent their knees and worshipped Amon, all but Mordecai, because he was a Jew. Amon became so obsessed with Mordecai's fidelity to the first commandment that he plotted revenge not only against Mordecai, but against all of the Jews. Cunningly employing his position in the royal court, Amon or Amon issued a decree that all Jews living throughout Persia would be massacred on one day, down to the last man, woman, and child. To choose the month of this annihilation, lots were cast into an urn. The month chosen was the twelfth month, called Adar. Now, some believe that it was Ammon, an antichrist figure, who chose the day himself, the thirteenth day possibly in homage to the demon god Nergal. The scriptures relate that when Mordecai heard of this decree, he again privately approached es Esther and asked her to intervene with the king. But Esther explained that the king had proclaimed that none could enter his inner courts without being called. Those who dared were immediately put to death unless the king showed his clemency by holding out his golden scepter. It was then that Mordecai reminded her, Think not that thou mayest save thy life only, because thou art in the king's house more than all the Jews, and who knowest whether thou art not therefore come to the kingdom that thou mightest be ready in such a time as this. Now, this passage in the book of Esther also foreshadows Christian doctrine, for the Virgin Mary is placed above all others for the sake of all. Now, hearing Mordecai's plea, Esther, for the first time, commanded her uncle, saying, Go, gather together all the Jews, and pray ye for me neither eat nor drink for three days and three nights, and I with my handmaids will fast in like manner, and then I will go in to the king against the law not being called and expose myself to death and danger. Thus Esther, her maidens, and the faithful throughout all of Persia prayed and fasted. How tragically apt to our own day are these words from Esther's prayer for the people. We have sinned in thy sight, and therefore thou hast delivered us into the hands of our enemies, for we have worshipped their gods. Thou art just, O Lord, and they are not content to oppress us with most hard bondage, but attributing the strength of their hands to the power of their idols. They design to change thy promises and destroy thy inheritance and shut the mouths of them that praise thee and extinguish the glory of thy temple and altar. In the meantime, Amon planned Mordecai's death, preparing a gibbet upon which he would be hanged. 
Amman had every reason to believe that he would succeed. But his secret goal, as we find out as we continue reading the book of Esther, was the king's usurpation. However, armed with prayers and sacrifices to God and the king's love for her, Esther revealed her secrets to her husband, the king, denounced Amon, and pled for her people. And this one sentence from the book of Esther is also Our Lady's Prayer, as we in the church can recognize. If I have found favor in thy sight, O king, give me my people for which I request. Now the Bible tells us, <clears throat> but the king, being angry, rose up from the place of the banquet into the garden set with trees. Amman also rose up to and treat Esther the queen for his life, for he understood that evil was prepared for him by the king. And when the king came back, he found Amon, or Amman, was fallen upon the bed on which Esther lay. Now seeing this, and thinking that Amman's audacity knew no limits, the king ordered his death on the very gibbet prepared for Mordecai. The king then placed Mordecai in Amman's place, making him second in authority after the king. And here we have another emphasis that Mordecai is the figure type of a vicar, who is the steward of the king. Amman, as a figure type, suggests a high level infiltration within the kingdom. And if we can look at this as a figure type, that kingdom is the church. This high level infiltration, which I wrote about back in 2008 and again in my book, Fatima, the Signs and Secrets, plots to overthrow the king by first executing the steward of the monarch. And in this case, especially as we see it in the third secret, it appears to be the Pope, the vicar of Christ the king. To accomplish this, he and others laid plans to also destroy the king's allies, the elect, who in Esther's time were the faithful Jews, but who are, since Jesus' death and resurrection, the loyal Catholics. Amman's act of throwing himself upon Esther, which so angered the king, implies a great offense against the Virgin Mary, resulting in the wrath of God. To continue with the story of Esther, to save the Jews, the king gave Mordecai liberty to issue a new edict commanding the Jews to gather themselves together and to stand for their lives. After the battle of the 13th of Adar, the king was told the number of those slaughtered, which included Amman's ten sons, and then asked Esther, What wilt thou have me to command to be done? Esther asked that it be granted to the Jews to do tomorrow in Susan as they have done this day, and that the ten sons of Haman may be hanged on gibbets. And so it was that the Jews defended themselves in the capital city on both the 13th and 14th days of Adar, but in other areas of Persia, the battle occurred only on the 13th day. Now, from the human standpoint, the requests of Mordecai and Esther appear vindictive, but when understood as figure types, we better follow the meanings. The Jews represent the ecclesia of the old dispensation, saved from annihilation. Esther's request to the king signifies the Virgin Mary's desire to save God's people and also to completely eradicate all of the heresies afflicting the Catholic city. While the death of Amman and his ten sons suggests the defeat of the apocalyptic Antichrist and the ten horns of the beast. The doctrine of mediatrics of all graces is foreshadowed in Esther, the mediatrics of her people. Thus we see again that Esther is a great figure type for the Virgin Mary, especially under her title, Our Lady of Fatima. Like Esther, the Virgin of Fatima acts to save her people from annihilation, first asking that the Pope, bishops, and the lay faithful heed all of her requests. 
Unlike Esther, however, the Virgin Mary does not need our prayers and sacrifices for her own sake, but for ours. Until the next time, may God bless you, and may Our Lady Mary keep you and yours under her starry mantle. Salve Regina. 